This video made in partnership with Velotrek. So you've at least decided to look at buying an e-bike. Amazing, but there are so many e-bikes out there and so much technical jargon and things that are left intentionally vague, we'll get to that later, that it can be hard to make a decision on which e-bike to buy. So in this Decoder episode, my explainer series here on the channel, I wanted to take the time to talk about the things that you absolutely need to know before you buy an electric bike that probably isn't apparent to most people. Things like the very confusing laws and their loopholes, power specs, and more. Okay, first, let's really quickly touch on the types of electric bikes. Because just like normal bikes, and probably even more so with electric bikes, they come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and styles for you to choose from. Bottom line, you simply need to decide how you plan to ride your e-bike. Are you only gonna use it to commute in the city? Then you probably don't need one with crazy suspension. And my favorite one with a larger battery, longer range, and a more street bike-like style, like this Velotrek Discover 1 here. Do you wanna go on trails or the beach, even occasionally with it? Then maybe you need fat tires and more torque to get up hills, as well as better suspension, like this Velotrek Nomad 1 here. Are you going to want to transport it in a car and go ride somewhere else with it. Then a folding e-bike might be good. And maybe you want to be able to use it to exercise once in a while, if you know that's, that's your thing. Then you'll aim for one that has a good amount of gears and functions like a normal bike whenever you turn off the motor. And then once you've decided on the type of bike, then, well, take a look at what comes with the bike. Because I found a lot of bikes don't include things that you actually really want, and you won't realize that until well after you bought it. For example, lights. Not only for safety, but also to be able to ride at night and see what's in front of you. Also, fenders. Despite being electric, a lot of e-bikes are actually water resistant, and a lot of them are expected to also be ridden in the rain even. But in the rain, or even just in places with puddles, fenders are super important, as without them, you'll have water splashing up in your face from the front tire and have a fun streak of dirty water on your back from the rear tire. Now, some bikes, even pretty expensive ones don't come with these things. And so you're expected to then go buy them after the fact. So just something to keep in mind when you're looking at bikes. And that's something I like about the Velotrek bikes that they sent for this video. They are way less expensive than comparable bikes and yet they still come with all of those things. Okay, so far all the things we've talked about could also probably pertain to a regular bike. So now, let's talk about the electric parts of the electric bike. Firstly, there are two different types of motors usually on e-bikes, mid-drive and hub motors. Mid-drive is actually inside the crank of the bike, while hub motors are in the back or front wheel. Mostly back, as it's easier to push a bike than it is to pull it. Truthfully, all you really need to know is mid-drive motors are considered more premium because they keep a lower center of gravity and they can produce power through the gears as they generate power before the gears happen and are just kind of considered smoother. But truthfully, most e-bikes you're gonna see are gonna have hub motors just because they're cheaper to make and that in turn makes the bikes cheaper. And they also can produce plenty of power and they work very well. Now the next electric part of the bike we need to talk about is the battery. So obviously the bigger the battery, the more range you could potentially have with your e-bike, but that also means more weight. And so again, if you plan to ride it out for a long time, then a bike with a larger battery capacity, usually shown in watt hours, might be more important. But if you need to pick that bike up a lot to maybe carry it upstairs for some reason, or you're gonna use it off road where the weight will affect the handling over less than smooth terrain, you might want a smaller one instead. Which actually brings us to how the battery on the bike is charged. It's important to know. Now I prefer any battery that is removable. This is because it allows you to have multiple with you if you need and feel like carrying in a backpack to swap them on a ride. But more importantly, it means that you can lock your bike up 
and bring the battery in to charge it separately instead of lugging the bike itself to a power outlet every time to charge. <laughs> Okay, so we need to switch gears for a second, no pun intended, and talk about e-bike laws, just real quick, because they have some interesting rules that can greatly affect your decision on buying a bike. So to start in a nutshell, most of the US puts e-bikes into multiple classes like what we have in New York City. Class one is pedal assist only, which means that as you pedal, the motor kicks in to help push you along. These must be limited to 20 miles per hour in assistance. So once you hit that speed, the motor stops helping you push. You can pedal on leg power over that though, of course. Class two must also have pedals and can have pedal assistance from the motor, but also are allowed to have a throttle so that you can use the electric motors without pedaling. Again, up to that same 20 miles per hour. Neither of these two classes require any helmets, at least here in New York City, but of course, they're recommended. We then also have class three here in New York City, at least, which is the same as class two, but it allows up to 25 miles per hour and it does require a helmet. Federally, we have some other requirements that are important to know. In specific, all of these e-bikes must have operable pedals. We'll get to why that's important in a sec a top speed under the power of the motor, like we mentioned, of 20 miles per hour, and must have an electric motor of under 750 watts. So long as they meet this criteria, they fall under the Consumer Protection Safety Act of a bicycle. If they're over this criteria, then they fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation as a motor vehicle. So all of the bikes you see that meet this criteria do not require any driver's license to operate, nor do they have to be registered compared to say a motorcycle or a moped. Now again, most of the US follows a similar set of rules, but I'll leave a link below that has all of the different states and the differences between those if you're curious. I'll also leave another link for the EU as again, they're similar, but they have some rules that are a little stricter. Here's where things get a little interesting though when it comes to buying an e-bike. So, all bikes need to be limited to a 750 watt motor. Now you would assume that two bikes that both have a 750 watt motor would perform the same, but that's just not the case. The first thing is, there isn't really a standard way of rating the wattage of an e-bike. So, a motor manufacturer might use a continuous power rating to get that 750 watt number, aka the wattage the motor can run at indefinitely without overheating, but that's not the peak power it can put out. And it completely ignores the rest of the bike's power system, the battery, the controller, etc. Now, since the wattage or power that a motor can put out is technically the volts of the battery multiplied by the amps of the controller, or the thing connecting the battery to the motor and determining the current electricity between the two, the same motor with a 36 volt battery and a 20 amp controller will put out a very different power, theoretically 720 watts. Then that same motor connected to a 48 volt battery with a 35 amp controller, theoretically 1,680 watts. And even that's not really a great way to determine the performance of an e-bike. It's just a better way than just looking at the wattage of the motor alone. But the issue is on some manufacturers' websites, they don't list anything but the wattage of the motor. Another number you can look for to try and help with this is the torque or the acceleration. Now, when all e-bikes are legally limited to 20 miles per hour, the torque can determine how much push you get and how fast you get to that 20 miles per hour, as well as the overall feel of the bike. Now, some manufacturers will show this in the form of Newton meters. So if you see that on two bikes, you can use that to sort of determine the acceleration, but also this will be affected by the weight of the bike and a lot of other factors. But bottom line, most of the time, the numbers you see on a manufacturer's site won't really give you a clear understanding of the performance of a bike. The only real way to know is to check reviews or ideally try the bikes yourself. Personally, I wanna see a new metric. I wanna see zero to 20 mile per hour times. In the same way that we have for cars, a zero to 60 time, and that gives you a better understanding of the car's at least acceleration. Why don't we have that for e-bikes? For example, with a 48 volt, 14.4 amp Tesla grade, 692 watt hour battery cell made by LG and Samsung and a 750 watt, 1200 watt peak rated motor, this Velotrick Nomad 1 is able to put out 75 Newton meters of torque. So in the real world, for example, this Velotrick Nomad 1 takes off the line way faster than the much more motorcycle looking, more expensive Super 73R Brooklyn here. Bottom line, don't judge a book by its cover. Also real quick, something we need to talk about, speaking of that 20 mile per hour limit. Well, a lot of manufacturers allow you to actually turn that off, either on the bike itself somehow or through an app. You just have to agree that you're using it on a private road for them to you know, not be liable in the eyes of the law, and then it'll only be limited by the bike's 
power. To be honest though, here in New York City at least, 20 miles per hour is plenty. Going any faster than that, or even that fast, you're bound to run into something. A red light, a stop sign, pedestrians jumping out to the road, car doors opening. Every three feet, basically, there is something that you'll need to slow down for. So, eh, I don't think you need to do it, but something for people to know before you buy a bike. Lastly, a quick note on security. I already had my last e-bike stolen right outside my office in broad daylight next to people having brunch. So, buy the best lock you can and maybe insurance even. Renters homeowners insurance might cover it, but in my case, they had a loophole that said they wouldn't if the bike could go over 20 miles per hour. And since the Super 73 that was stolen listed the ability to go over that on their website, they wouldn't cover it. Not sure what the speed has to do with it being stolen, but check the fine print of your insurance policy if you go that route. And also there are specific bike insurance companies that aren't expensive that might be worth a quick Google search as well if you live in a metropolitan area. Now, after my bike was stolen, I kind of vowed to make a video on all of the ways to not get your bike stolen. So that will be coming out later. Subscribe, ding the bell so you get notified when that happens if you're interested in that. Otherwise, there you go. Hope that shed some light on e-bikes and the buying of an electric bike in general. Also, if you need a nudge in the right direction, I'll leave a link below to a video I did on the best e-bikes available for various types of riders. Also head to the link below to check out the Velotrick Nomad 1. Shout out again to them for helping me make this video. But it's been a long day, it's late, and uh, I'm gonna go get some pizza. It might not seem that apparent to most people. Truck? And it begins. So, in this bike, <coughs> we'll wait. I haven't found the park in New York City with more children than adults in it. It seems, it's sweet, it's cute, sort of. It's not great for filming though. Firstly, there are, nope, children screaming. Oh, he's crying, he's gonna cry. I can see his face, his face is sad. Oh, he's upset about something. If you plan to ride it out for a long time, hold please for people walking through leaves. I need a haircut. <laughs> what does that sound? Oh, it's a hair dryer. <laughs> I was like, someone's power washing something. In the park. Where the weight, pop, pop, pop. Woof, woof. It's a dog, he doesn't like another dog. It's weird, that never happens. So to start, in a nutshell, most of the US puts e-bikes into multiple classes like what we have in New York City. Motorcycle. Scooter, technically. Does not fall under the e-bike laws. <laughs> that was a motorcycle. Hold please, for the run club. Pedal on leg powder. Oh, powder, leg powder. It's late. 